Hello, everybody. Back with another episode of the Monty and Wolf Show with our only guest ever who is making his return to the show, Gen G CEO Arnold Herr. Welcome. Good to good to be back, you know, uh, <laughs> party of one. <laughs> You're the only one who ever comes on this show as the guest. You're the only one we ever invite. So we haven't even had anybody <laughs> turn like us down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. They, they saw me once and nobody nobody else wants to come on the show or. <laughs> no, no, it's just uh, we don't we don't need guests here. Also, obviously, doing an LCK show in English, there are a limited number of guests that it is, in fact, possible to to get on shows um but we wanted to invite you on here because you guys just get got absolutely clapped by kt <laughs> and you will now be apologizing profusely to the english language fans for your failure to deliver an undefeated season go that's true that's true you know when we were putting the, together the roster that's what we were thinking this team is never gonna lose uh, <laughs> and, and we failed you faithful uh <laughs> faithful fans all around the world so uh <laughs> All right. Well, jokes aside, we are actually here to talk about the systemic changes that have been announced for the LCK. Um, we've gotten some kind of limited information, at least in in English so far, uh, That, but there's obviously a lot of details, probably many of which you can't share publicly, about how this is actually going to be implemented within the scope of the LCK and perhaps some more technical details if they've even been worked out, because right now we know there is going to be what what is colloquially called a soft cap, which means that there is a luxury tax above a certain threshold, but we don't actually know what that threshold is. The yeah. details of the, the amount of luxury tax, the purpose behind the sudden implementation of this policy, et cetera, et cetera. So where would you like to start with this? <laughs> I think um, I can't speak for the league right like let's let's try to uh put make that like a, a starting point as in we're one team out of 10 uh we're one vote out of 10 uh so i think i'm going to try to stick to um what our perspective what we've sure. seen a lot more on kind of like our numbers and what, what i can share from our side um also because a lot of the stuff is fresh uh, i don't know what i'm allowed and not allowed to talk sure. about from the league side like i don't have like a the right guardrails on it but what i can do is like reveal more about what we've seen why you know we think you know this is something that is necessary um some of the trends that i've seen just happen in the league uh i think that's that's probably a good place to start um yeah, to kind of just a background of why this even became a topic uh yeah, and everything and, I, and then and what details we have from our set that we have yeah i think um you know why it's really important to have you on the show as a guest right now is because Clearly, there has been a lot of smoke around the LCS and a lot of conversations about what is sustainable within that ecosystem, particularly with the players kind of walking out and the dissolution of the Challenger League and the falling viewership, the complaints of the owners about not being sustainable from a financial perspective. The information that's been revealed that at the lowest point in time in the LCS, the player salaries were 120% of revenue, which is, I mean, obviously not sustainable when you want that number to be more about 50% in a traditional sports league. But there's also a lot of concerns, like because the LCS has tanked so much of the aggro, I feel like it's taken away from the conversation of even though LCK and other leagues we're are not having big drops in viewership. In fact, the viewership is, by all accounts, excellent in the LCK. Um, it would appear on the surface to be doing quite well, and yet many of the rumors and and information that's come out from behind the scenes is that even in that environment, one that looks good from the outside, the teams are really hurting. Yeah, I mean, I think from our perspective, especially, uh, we've been kind of outperforming when it comes to you know what the metrics that we look at right so this whole industry was built basically on sponsorship revenue um and a hope that in the future there could be media revenue and in terms of the sponsorship side which is what the teams control we've been consistently number one in the league right and this is without you know we were number one in the last few years 
and that was without championships under our belt. And thank God we we got a couple uh, domestic titles uh, recently. Um, but even with all of that, the last few years, right? We've been number one in sponsorships. We've never been number one on payroll. We've usually been around top three uh, in payroll um, over the last four or five years. So putting together a very competitive team without kind of blowing it out uh, like other teams have. Um, and even then, we've been losing about two to three million dollars a year, right? Running this team, right? I mean, just the team operations costs around food, housing, just apparel, sandals, <laughs> whatever pops up, you know, that costs around like two hundred thousand dollars a year, right? Well, but you, but just to clarify, so it sounds like the a lot of the costs you're talking about really are more just about like running operations though and not the team salaries itself at least for gen g you know you're saying like for I for you guys you're Shobie's top three team. team yeah i mean like you guys are a top three team in terms of uh you know sponsorship you said you're number one but like maybe in terms of bankroll like not actually breaking the bank with salaries per se like you do have chovy and he's rumored to be <laughs> on a very high salary of course but is it the salaries that are costing the, the majority of that operations cost or is it more like um, just like the team house and stuff like that that you were just mentioning? I mean, by far, uh, it's definitely the player salaries, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've seen that grow from maybe around like 5x over the last few years. Um, and that's, and we're, by the way, we, this isn't to say none of these, these players don't deserve it. I think these players are some of the hardest working best players in the world. The problem is the revenue isn't there, right? And, you know, I, I, I think about it like this, right? You take the most popular player in the world, the greatest player of all time, right? You take his social media, you look at it, and you think this guy, incredibly popular. Everybody in the world knows him. Austin Reeves has the same number. Austin Reeves uh, was a six man for the Lakers. That guy has the same number of Instagram followers, right? Like we somehow forgot to build the right building blocks to create the revenue streams uh, that we need for the long term, right? Whether it's attention, whether it's social media, whether it's actual digital revenue and selling skins like you do in Valorant. Um, none of these revenue streams actually got in place, right? And so, you know, with the most recent uh, announcement on the SFR, uh, by the way, SFR is the official term uh, for the this sporting thing. financial regulations. Yes, <laughs> yes, and I'm going to stick to the script name. on that one. So that's that's. Um, <laughs> don't so the, call it a cap. Don't. So don't the you SFR, call it a cap, anybody. So the SFR. One of the things that we that people missed was a couple of things, right? One, I wish they actually made this announcement. I think I can talk about this. Uh, the average player payroll in the LCK. You take all the teams, put it together in average is higher than the LPL this year, right? And we're working on a fraction of the revenue, right? Because we're so dependent on Twitch, on YouTube. These guys don't pay. That's not their strategy to pay a lot for esports content, right? And so already we're kind of on the back foot, right? Um, number two, I don't know if you guys saw, but the there's a floor now on what teams need to spend, right? And if you saw it, I think that's a really good thing because you know we want to try to balance out uh, what what you know teams we basically we don't want teams just tanking it, right? Uh, are you are you referring to the minimum salary that players have to get, or are you talking about a different like uh, floor entirely? So that's I don't think they made any regulations that I know of on any individual uh, salary. Um, so, but as a as the entire payroll for a team. You have to now spend 70% of the league's revenue share, right? I think that was in the announcement. Um, and yes. if you think about it, most leagues work all in at 50% at, yes. as the ceiling, right? Yeah. So our floor is 70% of the league revenue share, right? Um, and so this is not such a drastic move. Um, that we're making when you compare it to functioning, sustainable sports leagues. Um, I think this is just kind of a first step in figuring out like, hey, how is this actually going to work? How do we create a league that has one or two years of bright lights and then it just all comes crashing down? Um, we've seen that happen in other leagues that I won't mention. Um, but, you know, I think Are you that's... part of those leagues, Arnold? <laughs> Um, so... Are you part of those leagues? Um, so what, what I, is the Seoul I... dynasty? <laughs> 
So, you know, I, He's I just going to ignore me. <laughs> Cause so if you, I, if you ignore me. So I've, I've seen this happen where if you create something, something unsustainable and you expect other people to pay for it at some point, people are going to stop paying for it. So we need to create our own revenue streams that actually make sense. Um, you know, our, our team has been very successful. We wish we were more successful, and we also wish we beat KT uh, this week, uh, or last week, I guess, because this is in Korea time. Um, but, you know, still, you know, outperforming the field when it comes to the main sponsorship uh, revenue side, we're still losing two to three million a year, right, uh, running this team. And now with the way the markets have moved, not as many sponsors are interested in sponsoring esports teams. So right? I do think it's important to draw a distinction between Gen G and some of the more uh you know long-term legacy teams within esports in Korea because while I'm sure that you guys are doing better sponsorship revenue, I imagine that those numbers are not including the the marketing value that SK Telecom and KT are getting by sponsoring their teams, right? Exactly. Because uh, that's like a this that's like a yeah, core was, part of it, right? And and for me, this is the, the first thing I was going to bring up is like, there are certain teams, obviously, that have the backing of orgs that are like hundreds of times bigger, like thousands of times bigger than the entirety of the LCK, basically, as, as a whole, like SK Telecom, KT, Hanwha Life, um, which is a huge company, which is part of Hanwha, which is massive. Right, you have these companies that are massive brands that actually own these teams, um, that are like uh, huge companies in Korea. Like we call them Chebol companies, right? So for teams like this, like they're the LCK is like not even like one percent of like their spending <laughs> in, in a year. Um, and I know a lot of these teams have also been outspoken about how they're unhappy with uh, the current costs of the league, even though like. For them, it's like a drop in the bucket would be would be over like overestimating how much they're actually spending compared to like what their their overall revenue is for a year. Um, and and for me, like it's hard to really quantify, you know, what you're making in terms of sales on um, jerseys and and other side content that teams like Hanwha are making because Hanwha makes a lot of side content, right? When they like they are actually trying, you know, to to make other things and, and and build a brand for their players. But other teams are like not trying at all. Like and you know they're complaining about like I'm not making any money off of the LCK right now. But they're like legit not making any effort like whatsoever. Period. And, and they're relying on what the LCK is doing. They have to pay for these player salaries. And they're like, but I don't know. Like I can't make money now. And I'm like, but you didn't even try. And so my frustration with all these regulations in a lot of ways is that. Um, the players who are working the hardest, like the players who are doing their jobs the most, like the players who work insane hours every week to to put up their results, they're actually not, they're the ones who are going to ultimately suffer when they have really short careers right here, ultimately in terms of how much money they can make for the, the time they're spending and how many years they've put into this. Um, and I think that's the biggest criticism people have with this is like, why should the players be the ones who have to like pull this back? And I know the players are the ones who are the, the main cost at the same time, but... I wonder if there are other solutions maybe in terms of what the LCK could do to try to push the the players to to increase revenue, make them more popular than what we're doing right now. Um, because at the moment, like you said, Arnold, um, Gen.G is, is making a ton of money off of sponsors. They're working really hard on that. Other teams, again, some of these Chayball teams, I won't name them by name, but some of them don't have sponsors almost at all. There are some teams in the LCK whose jerseys are practically empty, even though they have massive backing. And those teams are also then complaining that they they can't they can't afford this. And I feel like the amount of effort teams are putting in is not equal at the moment in the LCK. Well, let, let's break down because um, I, I, what you're saying, I disagree with parts of it. Um, so I think there's some nuance to this, right? So you know, I used to work at Google, and there's always this argument like, oh, it's a drop in the bucket for a major company like Google, right? And I work actually in the strategy and business operations side, which is looking at different divisions, understanding the cost, revenue, and, you know. So when you're a large company, it's not free reign to just spend whatever you want, right? Each division has to make sense. And sure. you have to compare it 
to other divisions that can also produce the same amount of value for you, right? For the same dollar, right? And when you say, oh, this is so much branding, it's going to help sell more phones or, you know, these kind of things, I would argue that it may not compare to other things that you could spend money on, right? You still need to have financial discipline, even if you're a gigantic company. And, and I would say the advantage of a gigantic company will be seen once you actually have a sustainable league and they actually see a return on their investment versus right now, we are spending millions of dollars that you could sign one K-pop idol and you would get more reach than you would any of the players except for you know, one player that is amazing <laughs> and, you know, please hurry back. Our viewership needs you. Uh, <laughs> um, Baker, of course. Yeah. He's talking about Baker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think if you take a look at that, right, which is, oh, you gotta, you gotta do this content. You gotta do this content, but the war for eyeballs is bigger than ever. Right. And you can sponsor P sick university, Right. And you can buy out P sick university. You can buy out your guys podcast and probably get a lot of similar viewership uh, than you would from the match or building up a player or player content, because there's a little bit of fatigue around esports and league content in general. Right. And so when you compare the reach that you can get versus other things, even if you're a large company, the ROI just isn't there. Um, but I, the other part, though, that I agree with you on is that I view this as more of a failure that we bear as one team, but also as a league that we couldn't figure out a real revenue model. Like I want all of our players making 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million. I want our players getting a messy contract, right? Um, I want to compete with, what, what is that? Like golf uh, thing that's happening, right? Um, that's Live. where we should be. Yeah, that's where we should be. But the biggest problem is, sponsorships alone don't work as a revenue stream right it just doesn't make sense right every other sports league has a primary revenue stream that's directly tied to the viewer to the fan and we don't have that and it's oftentimes, like oftentimes yeah and oftentimes that's a media deal that doesn't really exist in esports anymore because a lot of the the big media deals we've had with YouTube and Twitch um with for example Overwatch League have really burned um these media companies let's say Twitch and YouTube away from partnering with these these orgs because the return for them wasn't good enough so I I think that that's like something that esports is missing because that's kind of like the freebie right that we just don't have at the moment in esports so there's a huge gaping hole there and some of the tertiary revenue, like some of the side stuff, like jersey sales and whatnot, we're also just not there yet, right? Like we you, teams are not actually making like, I mean, how how much would you say re cost is recouped from like jersey and merch sales for Gen G versus like the player salaries? Is it even five percent? Probably not even close, right? Not even close, right? Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get a lot of complaints whenever something sells out, uh, but you know the amount of sales that we actually make on it is nothing, right? I mean, you're getting a fraction. Uh, and actually, a lot of teams, if they, I used to work in e-commerce as well. I had, I had many different things I did. Um, a lot of teams, uh, I've taken a look at their numbers. When they fully bake in their costs and actually do what they're supposed to do, uh, if you're a fashion company or an e-commerce company, they're actually losing money. Um, they just haven't, like, marked down their debt inventory. Um, and they aren't taking, yeah, anyway, delivery costs and a bunch of other stuff, they're actually losing money. Um, so jersey sales are not the answer. Um, sponsorships alone is not the answer. At the end of the day, right now, if you take all of the player payroll uh, versus all of the revenue that teams make, that the league provides, you know, it, it's, it's multiple times. The player payroll is multiple times all of the revenue that's actually brought into the league. Right. Um, and that's not even including all of the operations costs and marketing costs and staffing costs and all of this stuff. Right? Production costs as well that are borne by Riot. Oh, right? production costs are incredibly expensive. Like, so sure. that's one of the things that people don't seem to understand is that, oh, you should just raise ticket prices. Well, yes, you should, just because, I mean, you know, you want to create a premium product and, you know, make sure that it's fair and all of that kind of stuff. And not, I don't think a hundred seats in Lowell Park raising yeah. the ticket price is going to move the needle. Uh, I mean, I don't want to reward these resellers, but that's a whole different topic that I hate resellers. But anyway, um, yeah. the production cost of each show, the production cost of finals 
is many, many multiple times more than the ticket revenue that's brought in, right? Yeah, um, and the LCK, the, the LCK spends more money on finals than most regions. Like we, that's our finals have always historically been since the OGN days a massive spectacle, and that expectation yep. is there. You, we don't wing it like the other regions. No offense, but like they kind of just get a venue and then they show up and they do like a pre-show like normal and they just do the thing. Um, and then like a trophy trophy ceremony happens on like a small stage, right? We don't we don't do that in the LCK. Like ours is always a spectacle. I think the fans would be extremely unhappy if that was. Um, taken away and we just did a budget finals so the the cost of the finals and now that we have a two-day finals basically the double finals back to back because you have the losers finals into the finals is even higher than ever um right now yeah i mean right now you'll make more money being a uh, an intern at riot than you would owning a second place team in uh in 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 lck or in the world right i mean i might be a little different we have we haven't won worlds under my watch, uh, unfortunately. So I don't know what those skin revenue is like. Um, but you know, that's that's the reality right now. Is that you could be second in the world and you would make more money being an internet riot, right? Than than you know being the second best team in the world. Um, so something clearly is broken, and it's not the players' fault, right? I I, I want to make that clear. Like the players deserve every dollar. They work the hardest by far. Especially in the LCK, um, you know, I'll sneak a little diss in here for the LCS. Um, but you know, <laughs> these guys are. I'm always the reason why I do this job is not because of money, right? Like, there's a lot of other jobs out there that pay a lot better. Um, but I love this stuff. And the other part is, I'm like inspired every day because I like go and Peanut is grinding like crazy, Chovy's grinding like crazy, like the whole team and just how hard they work. It also keeps me young. Like I get that energy of like how hard they work and the staff and everything around it is super exciting, but we got to fix this. Otherwise all this good stuff, all these good feelings are just going to disappear or I, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the, or right. is like, or everything falls apart, right. And it dies, um, I guess is what you were going to say. But the, the thing for me right now is that the salary uh sorry the sporting financial regulations um which is of course a kind of luxury tax cap type situation doesn't solve any of these problems it it basically is a band-aid which says okay the teams now are allowed to spend less and we've agreed as a whole that like it's not just going to be some teams spend less to survive and then other teams just win all the time which right now if you see which rosters are winning um, it has kind of been for the last few years, like the teams that spend the most and have the best players just kind of win by default. Um, I think we're starting to see some, some of that is changing a little bit, um, this year, but the situation is basically players are not going to be able to make as much money, but also this doesn't, this doesn't encourage teams necessarily to actually solve some of these problems and like figure out what's going to, what, where that revenue is going to be. And the fact that the players have to to foot the bill on this to a certain extent is what bothers me the most about this. And as you were saying, and like we both agree on, the players are the ones that work the hardest. And then also viewership, I think, in the in the LCK has been intrinsically always tied to the fact that it has been the best region um, and historically was, right? Even though right now like it, there's some contention between is the LPL the best region, is LCK the best region, LPL defending MSI champions, whatever. But these players that are super popular, like Faker we talked about earlier, are famous because they represented Korea overseas. So even domestically, it's not just like people watch the LCK because that's where the Korean players are. The LCK is popular because overseas Korean teams have dominated. And this has kind of always been a thing in Korean esports. If Koreans do well overseas, it becomes a national well, thing. There's like, also, I think in the LCK's case, also a history of having a prestigious English language broadcast that started in the OGN days, obviously, even before I was there, right? And yeah. um I, I think at least with LPL, it's always been a a less comprehensible and easily digestible circuit to English speakers. And so the combination, like even if LCK isn't the best anymore, LCK still has much higher viewership because people have been trained and like watching the LCK and are, are hooked into those narratives. And I, I think that like if you start um capping so to speak the potential for these top tier players to to make the money they think they can deserve and that they can and will get elsewhere if they leave then the decline of the play and the decline of the star players means that the viewership goes down and then everything collapses anyways right like if the viewership starts shooting down sure. then you don't even have that sponsorship money and so 
this this solution, which is really just in my mind kind of a band aid because it doesn't really solve the the main problems, is is very uh, concerning because I, I I myself as an LCK caster and someone who has loved and watched the LCK for many many years even before being a caster uh, of the LCK is that some of these players might go to China or other regions. We don't at the moment have a pipeline of superstar players that are actually going to be super popular instantly when they join the LCK. Like Challengers is just not that stream. There is no like, oh, suddenly Griffin is promoted. This team is super hype and we're going to follow this team and they're not making that much money yet. So the team's not going to collapse. But look at this new hype team that's going to bring in viewership. We're kind of not there right now. And if the top starts leaving, who's the new players to replace is kind of a question that we have. And we've talked about actually with Arnold on this show before is where, you know, what what happens if like a lot of our top players leave and viewership goes down? You've we've created a new problem as well. Like, uh, I, well, uh, one thing I want to correct you on though is that the LPL does have the SFR in place as well, right? And yeah. they've actually seen their numbers come down, right? They've had it for two years now, I think. Um, number two, um, if you think about it this way, right? Our, the LCK has the highest average payroll, the highest payroll in the entire world right now, right? So this isn't like, hey, we're never going to get there. Hey, we don't want to maintain the number one spot. It's, well, the LPL is fixing itself. The LCK is the one, the only one that seems to still be broken. And the other part, too, that I would mention is I completely agree with you that the costs are born, you know, um, so one thing that I, I disagree with you on is sponsorship revenue across the board is down, right? We're going to be down probably 40% this year, right? Player salaries are not going to go down 40% this year, right? Um, so if you think about the only revenue stream that we freaking have besides, you know, getting 2% on jerseys or whatever the heck it is, <laughs> uh, you know, like w this is more of a reality it's a reality check and a first step to creating something sustainable. I, I disagree with the Band-Aid part in that without this, we're on a train that's going to crash, right? And into a brick wall of already this year, there's teams that have tapped out and said, nope, we're not doing it, right? And whether it's running a bare minimum roster or selling the team, losing their title sponsor, all of this stuff is already happening. So it's not to me, this is clearly the system itself is broken if we're not growing revenue fast enough, even though viewership is growing. And making sure that we have a league where many players can come in and be successful into the future, I think is important. Making sure that there's some stability in the high payroll and the high player salaries that is there already and that they can be maintained. I think that's also really important so that you know, it's not a up 40%, down 40% year over year kind of thing. Um, and I think that's why, if you look, it never says that, you know, the SFR is set where we're going to be the cheapest league, right? Sure, the no, goal yeah, is to not. be, the goal is to do this softly so that we maintain kind of our pole position right now, but have a mechanism that actually promotes sustainability instead of this thing where a bunch of teams are incentivized. You'll make more money running a team with zero sponsors and zero minimum players than you would having a championship team right now. Like that doesn't make any sense. Right. So for me, like the sustainability part has to make sense. Otherwise this is all just going to go bust. And one of the things that I think is kind of missed in terms of the context of, of uh, the luxury tax, like you can exceed the cap. Um, to my understanding, you can exceed the cap and pay a tax and on the everything SFR. And then, <laughs> in the SFR. Sorry, but it, you can exceed the from a numbers ceiling. perspective, the yeah. ceiling, uh, so to speak. And that tax is then redistributed to the other teams. And I really like that part because at least at, at, at to a certain extent, if you're like, I'm just going to go all out and buy all these players and, and I don't care about these regulations then the other teams actually will then get some money to then potentially be able to make their rosters more competitive. Um, so I, I actually like that aspect of it because the tax is redistributed to the the teams, is my understanding. So that's helpful, at least. 
Um, it's not like, it's like just LCK is like, cool, you guys broke the rules, thanks for the money. It actually goes to the teams. Um, and so that can be helpful because I know a lot of teams are financially struggling compared to others. Um, and that's just the nature of the league, right? Some teams' sponsors are bigger than others. Some teams' success rate hasn't allowed them to get larger sponsors. So I'm, I'm about that. I mean, I haven't talked to a single League of Legends team owner that is running a profitable team that has any kind of semblance of comp competitive quality to it, right? Um, it's If you're top five in any of the leagues any, anywhere in the world, you're losing a boatload of money. Um, and so, Except for maybe but, TSM right now, hilariously. TS <laughs> Honestly, TSM is doing pretty well. Like I gotta give credit. Uh, they were they were stage. technically number six, but I they are also running at like minimum salary, so they are definitely profitable. You know, I, I gotta say, like that's the other thing that I'm excited by that I think some other other teams may not be as excited by is uh, you can't just throw your wallet around uh, and um, and hope to win. Like you gotta actually make a roster that makes sense, and you gotta be. Judged oh, no, we'll on see that. about JDG. You just you just hold the phone on that one. <laughs> <laughs> or you can you or you or you blow it out and, and, and you pay and you pay the, pay the rest Arnold? of the teams that thank you <laughs> hey you so, know what i support ruler getting the bag i want him to be super successful i want every player to get as much money as they can like i would never like stand in the way of somebody getting getting their bag so uh, um i have a question for you arnold because the the rule is i mean i don't even actually know the answer to this question and, I, and you definitely will but like this rule is is coming into play it sounds like based on the announcement not even next year but actually at the end of 2024 or is it actually coming into place next year like is the are these regulations happening like during stove league as we call it in korea or is it like next year um at the end of the year so after 2024 ends Going into 2025, these regulations are in place. Um, so it's kind of a soft a transition, right? So in terms of the rules and the framework, it's in, right? So this next offseason, free agency, we're all, you know, part of the SFR regulations. Okay, right? so it's happening. It's happening. Like, yeah. But current afterward. contracts it's are exempted, right? Yeah, there's, there's a few... Um, points to it to not make to make sure that we're not pe penalizing teams from having legacy contracts and all that stuff that's like completely out of their control yeah, yeah right? of course right. that would be dumb um, yeah i'm glad <laughs> to hear that <laughs> um and then you know and then i think it starts stepping up into full going into next year's off season right um the reason for that is there's already teams i i'm getting hit up almost every week with a different team trying to sell their team, right? Um, it's really bad out there. <laughs> like, I, I can't stress this enough. Like, there are many teams out there right now, all around the world, that are actively trying to sell their team. And every month, that number gets lower for what they're selling it for, all right? So- Why would you buy it if you already owned an LCK slot? They, they usually hit me up for like, oh, like, I don't know. I, honestly, yeah, is that I think even allowed? I think like, it's, can you actually have two teams? <laughs> you know, pe so. people do a, a lot of dumb things, and you know. Uh, but uh, so, no, I can't own two teams. Is my first answer. Uh, that's usually my polite way of saying like, no, thank you. Um, but you know, I, maybe the bankers don't know or whatever it is. But you know, that's that's the reality of what we're facing right now. And so, for me, I'm fine. It, you know, one of the things that people criticize about this is like, well, you know, you guys are just trying to, you know, um, save money and, and and just keep the money for yourself. Well, number one, we're still going to be running this at a loss, right? Right. So 100%, I, I can guarantee you right now, this year, next year, the year after, 100% of every single dollar that we earn is going to go back to the players, right? What we're saying is there's, Beyond, but we have to figure out the revenue problem. But until we get some idea of what the target is for how much we want to spend on players, staffing, food, housing, everything, you can't even you don't even know what the target is for revenue, right? Because that just keeps going up, right? If player salaries out continue to outpace like they have and going three, four, five X sometimes, and if your sponsorship revenue this year is down 40%. 
something's not working, right? And by the way, I think we're still number one on sponsorships, even with us, me projecting us being down 40%. Like we've renewed all of our sponsors, but right now we're working more to do more custom activations, more side content with them, like more kind of like agency type work. And that's how we've been able to kind of maintain our, our strong foothold with sponsors. But I, I've, I've seen other teams that, like you said, I think to Wolf's point, some teams still expect to like slap a logo on the chest and expect the sponsor to pay a million bucks like this is not happening. Yeah, I mean we have I mean we have had like some um you know good news about sponsors this year for some of our teams like DRX for example was not one of those table companies like got a Shinhan uh partnership um Breon lost Fredit um and then was able to pick up OK Savings Bank right so some teams are like able to gain these large like title sponsors uh, for those team for OK Savings Bank Breon's actually a naming sponsor which is like the at the highest weight of Korean sponsorship, like, you know, D plus Kia, for example, the Kia aspect of that, that's what we call a naming sponsor in Korea. That's actually usually at like the highest. So, OK, Savings Bank Breon was able to pick that up um, for DRX. Shinhan is not, it's not Shinhan DRX anymore. It's like not quite at that level, but they have obviously a, a huge partnership with them. Um, they were able to pick up after Worlds and stuff like that. So there's at least like some some aspect of, of things going OK in terms of big sponsorships joining um, but ultimately, yeah, sponsorship stuff right now is not the greatest just around the world with the post COVID economy um, and viewership numbers in esports aren't continuing to grow like they used to. So a lot of sponsors who expected continued growth because they came in at the good time are now seeing like it's kind of plateaued a little bit. They're not as interested. So it's not the greatest time if you are hoping that sponsorship revenue is going to save you. Uh, I had another question for you, though, Arnold, because... Last year, we had the announcement about some of the the rule changes and agency changes, like some of the stuff that's going to happen in terms of like exporting players, for example, to China. They will they would then have to pay, supposedly, who knows how this actually gets enforced, a giant tax to the LCK. Um, these uh, sporting financial regulations aren't a replacement for this. Are they kind of like, are they stacked on top of each other now? Or, yep. or what, what happens with this exactly? Um, I think they're working through that right now. I think the SFR is a much bigger piece of the pie than all of that other stuff, right? Um, and like anything involving two different leagues, it, it's kind of more the mothership that handles it than like any one league in the LCK. Um, so I don't have too many updates on that specifically. Okay. Um, but I think you bring up a good point though uh, around the sponsorships and how teams are able to lock in sponsors, right? This stuff is, you know, one of the things that we fought for, or I fought for, uh, and it actually passed, I think I can talk about this one, is like, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, I would actually like the league to take uh, a bigger role and a, a more proactive stance in general around the actual business side, right? Like, it's, I think, you know, as myself, as one team owner, one out of 10, you know, I shouldn't be the voice of the SFR and whether it's right or wrong. And, you know, obviously I'll be biased. I want to I want to continue to run a team and run a company and not go bankrupt. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that works and I'm be biased towards supporting that. Right. And, and also winning worlds. Um, one of the things, though, is so even like small things that, you know, uh, I remember I pushed through was and you need the leak to do it is I don't know if fans know, but every one day a month there's a content day now, uh, which is we're not allowed to scrim. And that's when <laughs> that's when you actually have to do content or the league can call you in to do content. And you probably see you start seeing a lot more shoulder content now and all of this stuff. It's like, if you ask any individual team, oh, why don't you guys just do it? It's like, well, no, because one, you'll be less competitive because somebody else will be scrimming. Number two, players and coaches don't want to do this stuff. So you're kind of like for, <laughs> forcing them to do something they don't want to do. So you're use, using up some social currency, right? Versus when the league does it and says, you know, this is better for the league that we create more content, right? That this is a sports entertainment business, right? Like that stuff, I think we should lean more into. And, you know, one of the things that I've been really excited by as, you know, we have a discord, we have a bunch of fans from Korea and around the world in it. I talk to them and, they want to know about this stuff. They they actually are genuine super fans 
that care about the business side, that want this thing to grow and make sense for the long term. And it's kind of similar to, you know, I, I'm a big MBA fan. I was all into kind of like the MBA salary cap and the bird rights and all of this stuff uh, that was uh, that came on. And I really geeked out about that stuff, right? Trying to make trades actually go through and like trade uh, calculators and things like that. Um, so I think there's a enthusiast contingent that is interested in this stuff. I think the league and, you know, I'm one voice in the league that is pushing for the league to take a more active role in talking about this. Um, I know they had a session with the players to also explain why they're doing this so that it's not taken the wrong way. None of us want to pay the players less. We want to make more money and pay the players more. We want the sport to grow more. But right now, we don't have an easy way to make more money in League of Legends, right? So what do you think the, as you say, I mean, the big concern here is that the you are saying that the floor of spending has to be 70% of the revenue that the league shares with you, okay? Which is already not even close to your costs. So even if you were trying to break even, you would say 70% of the league shared revenue plus 30%, you would that would only be 30% for food, housing, coaches. Yeah. Uh, I assume coaches are not included in the 70%. Not right? included. Not included. So everything else, 70%. So basically, everyone is going to be losing money. Is the is is it unless you have no coaches and you go for the cheapest possible housing, food, et cetera? Um, so I mean, if you if you bring in a you know huge title sponsor, maybe you can around a minimum team. Probably not. <laughs> so, there we go. Okay, just checking. So if there's no. Um, I, I'm saying if there's no sponsorship, this is only just the revenue that Riot shares with you. Yeah, it is effectively impossible to run a break even team. Now. My question for you is because you have already said that you are planning to lose money in the future, that there is no other easy way to make revenue because there are no media deals on the horizon. Uh, Riot is not going to, as far as we can tell, share any of the digital revenue that they're making off of skins, which is, again, very unfortunate because especially in the Korean market, where so many, uh, so much, like a much higher percentage of the player base watches esports in Korea than in other markets. I think that's fair yep. to assume, absolutely. especially in the West. Absolutely. absolutely. Right. If you open the league client in Korea, it's all esports shit. Everybody watches it who plays League of Legends. It's very popular. The you know a large percentage of the people who do, which means that Riot must be selling more skins than in other regions. Based One on esports, like sure. the the attributable skin sales or digital transactions must be higher in Korea, the number of them, by percentage than they are in other regions, especially because there's a very large player base, right? And a lot of the, the world skins, for example, are of Korean players because Korea yes. wins worlds a lot. So, so they must, <laughs> you know, they must. And also, even if Korea doesn't win worlds, Korean players are winning worlds. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, Viper's got a skin that I'm sure is very popular in Korea. Uh, but when it, when it comes to, when it comes to this, because Riot isn't going to share that digital revenue with anybody, as far as we can tell, they have a plan in Valorant, but not in League of Legends. Um, and we are seeing no media rights deals in the future. You Basically, what you're saying is that the, it is just doomed to lose money, and the teams that are in the LCK are just going to have to lose however mi mi many millions of dollars that they lose every year. So how does this get better? Like, isn't uh, this just... Isn't the luxury tax just slowing potentially the bleeding it, aren't you still going to die this is kind eventually? of what i was saying earlier about the band-aid solution right you know so i think um i think a few things need to happen right so in the foreseeable future in the next 2 to 3 years i agree basically every team is still going to lose money if they want to run a competitive team in league right so not arguing with you on that point a few things need to happen one it's this Band-Aid or first step on the SFR actually puts a cap on how much money you can lose. Uh, actually, it doesn't because you can just spend your way through it. But um, that does slow down the bleeding, right? So the first thing, if your you know boat is on, isn't working and it's on fire, is try to put out the fire uh, from taking over the boat, right? Sure. But you still need to go somewhere with this thing, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to starve. Correct. Right? That's why uh, I'm asking, what is the plan? So I think at some point you do need some sort of digital revenue stream, 
right? I, I know it's been being getting pushed across the board, across all of the teams. Um, Everybody's so I, talking about it. I mean, frankly, like everybody is is like, how how are we going to get this digital revenue stream? Yeah. So I actually predict a few things will happen, right? One, um, and this is just this is me, not the league speaking again. This is an Arnold's doom and gloom kind of a thing. You're going to see continued consolidation in this space. We have too many teams, too many mouths to feed, especially with a mature game. And Riot is not a charity. Uh, let's put that, make that clear. Riot is going to act in their self-interest to extract the most amount of money possible, which is what a company does, right? Um, and so before they were able to depend on teams that were saying, hey, you know what, don't worry about it. We'll find investors, we'll find people that want to fund uh, this growth. But that has turned off, right? Anybody in esports going after venture money with a traditional esports business model, it's not going to work, right? I think that's why you're seeing a lot more teams diversify. I think 100 Thieves, for instance, has an energy drink and a game they're developing, right? They're kind of realizing that. They have a, let's just say they have a direct to consumer shipped energy drink and a Fortnite mod. Let's you're being you're being very generous to hundred right? <laughs> Very generous. Well, I, I appreciate that. But. but I think teams need to be trying a lot of these more riskier big bets in order for something to work. Because it's and that's what you're going to see. One is teams diversify because they realize that investing in a league that's guaranteed to make you lose money is not the play. Right? This is it's it's kind of like playing blackjack except you can't hit blackjack. Right, um, it just doesn't make sense, right? Number two, you're going to see teams go bust. There's going to be fewer teams, right? And then number three, I think there's going to be more innovation around digital revenue. Like a, a great example is, and I don't think this is just Riot's fault. It's nobody's fault. It's all of our fault. But if you look, it's crazy to me that when I'm watching a game, I have no way to buy the champion or buy the skin directly from a Twitch feed or a YouTube feed. That is insane. That that's, that doesn't make any sense. That There's just money insane. on the table, right? That is that is absolutely insane. I agree. Like that is like the fact that this hasn't been figured out yet by anybody. Like nobody's actually worked with Twitch or YouTube directly to actually solve this. When there are other third party tools that exist, for example, like if you're watching a Hearthstone stream, you can like put your mouse on the screen and see exactly what card it is and what its stats are. Like these tools exist, and yet, like Riot hasn't figured out a way for me to be able to be like. Oh, what skin is Chovy playing on Ari this game, and how do I buy it right now? Like that is actually insane. That that, that there is no way. That is think, that is actually crazy. I think also it's that for Twitch and for YouTube, their priorities are not esports or, or developing and supporting esports related tools. So in the long run, I think you're going to see. You are already seeing it more viewing and streaming platforms. Um, hopefully more catered towards esports. Uh, I think that's going to be something that that has to happen. Um, and what I would argue as well is we need a revenue stream that's directly tied to the player's popularity, right? Right now, we don't have one, right? It's all just kind of loosey-goosey. You love, you know, you love Peanut and, hey, you know, buy this Sono speaker, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't make sense versus, like, if there's a Peanut skin. Right. If there's and you're starting to see more of this stuff, you're starting to see it in the emoticons and these kind of things. These are first steps. This stuff is going to take years. Right. And so teams have to survive. Many teams will go bust. Um, so long term, I think it does fix itself. Short term, I think there's going to be a lot more pain to be felt. I already know a bunch of teams that are exiting the scene, trying to sell their team actively all around the world. Right. It's not just an LCS thing. Um, because no team in the world is making money off this thing right now. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, like one of my, one of my frustrations just real quick about some of these teams in the LCK though, is that the LCK has been franchised for two years, just two years. And this is a plan that everybody signed in on for the long term. And some teams, and I won't name names, but you could probably figure it out based on the actions of some teams. Some teams came in, spent a medium amount of money didn't find success and then instantly went budget and they're like, I can't survive, bro. It's impossible, man. These other teams just pay these players too much. And I think some teams legit within like a year were like, it's too hard. I don't know. I can't do it. It's too expensive. Don't buy a spot then. Like, and, and right, this is on Riot too to like not find the proper partners with some of these teams, for example, in the LCK who didn't actually want to do a long-term plan. And it's very common in my experience with Korean business 
to go, oh, I want the quick money. I'm getting in on that. Oh, it didn't work. I'm out. And like, that's just not how franchising works in a new league. And I, my frustration is some of those teams are the ones complaining about player salaries and we got to pay, pay our players less when they didn't even pay them that much in the first place. And that's really frustrating to me um, that like some of these teams are, are, are complaining about this when they these are also some teams who are not really using their players and content, not trying to build themselves up. They're, they're frankly like almost in, in this league for, it seems like somewhat of like they wanted the quick explosive growth for their company and their brand. And it didn't work out the, the way they wanted it. And I want to see some like some teams like Gen G, for example, frankly, and you're here and we could say this and you've already talked about this, are trying really hard. Okay. Like trying really, really hard. Yeah, and really Gen hard, G, for man. example, is not a, not a really company hard. that's not a billion dollar <laughs> company that's just like sitting on mountains of cash, right? So <laughs> I want to see <laughs> some of the teams that are that are potentially going bust and the teams that are struggling actually try hard first because uh, a lot of these teams that, that may potentially sell um didn't even give it a real try. And that's frustrating when we're in our second year. If we're talking about like an Overwatch League problem where it's like, oh man, I tried for like five years. It's really just not happening. Like I, I want out. Then okay, we can have a conversation. But I mean, this is like the infancy of franchising for the LCK. So it's still still early days. I mean, um, this was my perspective. Again, not speaking for the league, but I think it should have just been eight teams, right? I, I think if you think about how much revenue we're producing, right? Uh, and, you know, I think the LCK... Uh, in general, has a smaller revenue stream than the other more you know established larger markets and things like that. It's just too many mouths to feed, right? And you know, finding those right partners, I think, is very important. Um, what I would argue, uh, and this is just me thinking about it, but I actually believe that uh, the league needs long term to become a APAC super league very similar to the Valorant model. Um, the viewership uh, that you can get in the APAC region, the way sponsorships are sold and kind of a, a, and allocated to APAC is a lot larger. The amount of skins, the amount of digital goods you can sell with one force. And then also just the elevation that you can have when, you know, one of the things that I always talk about is, oh, we don't have enough international matches. What if uh, the LCK or the super LCK uh, had you know a slew of international matches and actually has a home base in Seoul that you know has a, a teams from all around the world being able to compete right like, like a conference type system like the NFL potentially right where you have like everyone is connected to the same tournament same league but like you have smaller regions within it so to speak or conferences and then they compete and then they obviously cross compete later on in the tournament yeah I mean so, I, that's something that's been discussed it was kind of the idea behind Overwatch League but you know, it didn't work out. I mean, you're not even going far enough, Arnold. I've been the advocate for, I fucking hate the regional leagues. I hate it because you cannot watch all of the great League of Legends in one league. Like, I don't want to watch four different leagues. I want one league with 20 teams where I can see gamers from around the world. You know, the question is, on a long enough timeline, if League of Legends is in real trouble then it's not just that APAC needs to be one region. It's that the, the best North American and European teams need to be in that region as well so that we constantly have international competition. There is no <clears throat> reason why we can't send the top performing organizations from North America and Europe to Korea as a home base and just play all of the matches out of Asia in a global Super League, like Wolf is saying with Overwatch League. That way it would allow you to actually sell globalized sponsors. Viewership is better in Asia too, you know? Uh, I don't want to hear anybody crying about like, but what about the viewership and the time zones? I mean, would, viewership is better in Asia and also and, people are watching the Korean leagues in their time zones already anyways. And, and also, same. as as we know, <laughs> as we know from Overwatch League, when this happens, the Western teams don't fucking suck anymore. Like there are some, better. There are some Western players that are going to get good enough to be competitive at the highest level. I think uh, there's probably a lot of comp. I, I can't speak for what other leagues are going through and, you know, the other regions are going through, but I, I would imagine there's some, like, disagreement from some teams that don't want that, some teams that would, and all of that complication uh, versus of I think course. there's less of that if you take a more of an APAC regional, right? Sure. Because there's no I mean, franchise teams besides... The yeah, LCK. I mean, there's a pipe dream what Monty is talking about. Yeah, obviously, but... like Riot would have to play Kingmaker and say, 
these are the orgs that we think have represented League of Legends the best. We are just giving you spots in the Super League. Suck at other franchise leagues. We'll still have regional leagues, but they're going to be feeder leagues into the Super League. Um, but I, I think what I would be in favor of is I'm tr still trying to figure out, to Wolf's point, you know, what's that three, five, ten x revenue opportunity that we need to go and capture, right? And, and the other part too is what are these small incremental improvements, like having a no scrim content day once a month, right, to make sure. I mean, that what? If, I, what it's content. a great. I mean, it's a great concept, and I'm glad you've implemented it. What was Riot's reaction to a proposal of why don't you have Twitch integration with skin sales? Uh, it's not Riot that doesn't want that, right? Riot would love to drive more sales, right? The problem is for a Twitch or a YouTube, this isn't their main focus, right? It's like an, a small additional revenue stream, but versus figuring out how to get more ad inventory and serve it and grow. I mean, the top Twitch line is having its own fucking problems right now, right? <laughs> yeah, every, every everybody's going through it, right? Or YouTube is just they're like this is. To them, esports and gaming, well, not gaming, but esports is such a small drop sure. in the bucket that they could care less, right? A at the very top. I'm, I'm not talking about it. The people that work there on gaming and esports, they care a lot. But, you know, I have exposure to the more top level there. It, it's just not a thing, right? Um, because other things move the needle so much more. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and what so, does Twitch gain from helping Riot sell sell skins, like in the grand scheme? You know, like maybe they could get a percentage, but like the amount of work it's required, like they they're just not interested at the moment. Well, also they, without they would have to do custom integrations for every single game that's out there, right? So building this out is actually technically a I'm big not, challenge. I'm not sure I buy that because gaming, at least, is big enough on as a whole on Twitch and YouTube that if you had an API integration, it would also integrate with regular streamers to which skins they were playing. In which case, it probably is worth it for YouTube. And, I, I, and I think it's a good game. feature that should be developed, and I'm sure, you know, at some point it will, right? It just just makes sense, Please. right? How long will it take? Now, you know, I, I worked at Google. It took us, uh, it took me three years to get a button installed on Google Maps. Uh, <laughs> but that button monetized like crazy. So I was uh, very excited when it, when it actually got in and our team was able to put, could put that button in. But, uh, you know, these things just take a long time. Um, and so, you know, I, it's hard to estimate what time horizon that these things will take. But I would actually be a proponent of making sure that, you know, players that are actively helping drive sales of skins and things like that, they get a cut, right? So... I think it's really important that every, to me, the SFR is the start of a very basic thing, which is we should incentivize people for helping grow the league and monetizing and selling stuff that they get a, that they get a, a share of the stuff they sell, right? And not just spend money into this pit and hope it works. I mean, the SFR to, in, the, in my in my mind is kind of like let's set less money on fire, um, basically, yeah. and. The problem is that, like, again, the 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 thing that makes people unhappy about this, including me to a certain extent, like I was saying earlier, is that the players are the ones who are making less money now, and they have short careers, and they sacrifice basically their entire lives and schooling, most of them, to be at this point. So, you know, the the player thing is not like a lot of people look at players making tons of money, and they're like, well, they don't even do that much. I'm like, well, first of all, they work insanely hard, and second of all. You know the salaries these players make for five years. They don't just then go like, "Oh, cool, like I, that's that's it. I'm set for life." If you don't make enough money in those in those years, like you don't have uh, a college degree, you don't have any work experience, and some of the players who don't make it and exit the scene at like age 26, some of them become coaches, right? If they were successful enough, if they were popular enough, if people trusted their opinions enough, a lot of them straight up go to 7-Eleven and like work, you know, a, a like nine to five job where they don't actually make proper money or have to go back and ask for help or go back to school and go into debt. Like the reason why, in my opinion, it's really important for players to make as much money as possible is because like, this is kind of like your, your career and your, your time. And most players don't get to have long careers like Faker, like Faker is an insane anomaly, right? To where, Faker's and, amazing. and like, of like... course, Faker obviously is making an insane amount of money on top of it all during that, that time. Right. But most players are making way less than him over four or five years where they're like sitting like your average player, like on a sixth to eighth place team, making slightly more than minimum salary 
And then after it's done, like, what do you have when your career is over, when you don't get signed and you're, you've, you're past your peak? Like, those players aren't going to be the ones affected too much by this, but the reason why players need to, to have as much money as possible in my mind is because there is no, like, after this for a lot of them, right? And so... Wait, wait, but I would... I, here's one thing that I would argue that the SFR actually does accomplish that to an extent, right? Because the very top players, the S-class, A-class players, both probably make about seven figures, right? All of them, right? So that's not who we're talking about when we're talking sure, about, sure. hey, you know, like... But I agree with you. There's a lot of players that have one two years they debut and it doesn't go very well or they never even debut right and so those players are actually helped by the sfr right because there's a floor now on how much you have to spend so well, a lot of those players are just making minimum salary rates so that like some of those players aren't even going to be affected by this like literally at all um but like no they absolutely will be because the team still has to spend to the floor right you can't do all minimum yeah, yeah. anymore right so sure sure, sure. I would actually, here's what I would, this is just me speaking again, like I'm actually a proponent of re continuing to raise the floor, continuing to raise, I don't think we're allowed to raise minimum because basically we don't want to touch any individual person's thing, right? But I would actually be in support of higher minimums, higher floors, um, maybe guaranteeing, you know, uh, contracts um, at the floor, so that it's not like, hey, you're in for one game and then sorry, see you later. Um, like all of those things, I think, could still be done under the construct of the SFR. And the thing that you're talking about is a little bit disconnected from the actual problem, which is the teams don't have money to spend, right? I, especially because in order to win, you got to pay multi-millions of dollars um, to get the top players in the world, right? That's not the who is going to face kind of these hey, you're out of the league and, you know, um, you don't have any money, right? So I would actually argue that, one, maybe the SFR doesn't go far enough, but that we should be pushing for higher minimums and better guarantees for the players that are on the lower end because I, I completely agree with you. I've been spending a lot of time in Korea talking to players, talking to players that never make it, and it, there's not that many options for them um afterwards uh one of the things that we started our academy was uh we actually created <laughs> careers for a lot of these guys and now they're under our payroll they're helping you know do game academy coaching and that's one option for them um but you know the other thing that's happening is that a lot of the money is getting managed poorly when they are a pro um and not because out of ill will but it's just Usually I mean, in young. Korea, you know, they're like super the young, like they don't know what to do with their money. Usually it's like the parents that manage it. And, yep. you know, it's not like a perfect, we offer, we try to offer investment services from a sponsor and these kind of things. But, you know, at the end of the day, just the, it's more traditional to have just the parents run the money. And then it goes into usually real estate in Korea and real estate's going to crash. I, I'm putting this out there. Real estate in Korea is going to crash. It don't, already has to a certain don't degree. I know, I know property. people. I know. Well, here's the thing about Korea is that with a declining population, eventually there's going to be an excess inventory of of real estate. Right, Arnold, because of the birth rate. And also, I know that some people in Korea are already underwater on mortgages. I mean, in it, Korea, basically, there are two there are two banks. There are two bank systems in Korea. There were there are the actual banks and the apartments you can see like over the horizon. <laughs> Those are like the two banks in Korea. And. Yeah, a lot of investment is very traditional for for older parents, right? In the older generation, like that's the way that was the way for them and their generation to invest the money. Like it was the safe and surefire way, and so that that old idea is still there. I think we're getting a little bit into the weeds on on yeah. this, but like, <laughs> um, no, but, but, I, but I I agree with yeah. you. I think better safety net uh, is something that we should strive for because right now, I've seen these guys, you know. I, I talked to them. A lot of them do a lot of our academy coaching, and they're doing a, such a fantastic job. Like, uh, I'm really thankful that that it worked out. But I asked them, like, what would you be doing if you know we didn't exist as like a gaming academy? And they're like, honestly, I don't know. Maybe a chicken shop or maybe a PC bong. But PC bongs aren't good business anymore uh, have, for a lot I of can PC tell bongs. You for every score. Like score obviously is came you know out of military to to become a you know coach of the year for LCK and like is really making a huge impact right for every score there are like twenty five players out there 
um, mm-hmm. that are, are struggling, you know? And obviously, Score was a high-profile player and was very famous, right? But for every Score, there's, like, so many players that, that you guys have watched over the years um, that are are struggling and, and do not have financial backing who are working um, a part-time job. And, I mean, in my career, I've watched so many players who were at the top as well. Like, I, you know, I won't name any names, obviously, but... GSL players, for example, back in the StarCraft two days when that was at the the booming peak, some of those top top players like took their earnings and tried to open, for example, like a chicken shop or a restaurant and totally bombed and are really struggling. Like because you know at the end of the day, you only have such a short career to earn as much as you can, and even for like top players in in some esports, you know, even if you have like a, if you say you made a million dollars in your career, that's not enough for the rest of your life, not even close. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I mean. I I do hope that we can also get some more things in place for the future of players. I know orgs like Genji are, are are working towards that. Um, but the other problem I have, okay, so that was like you know issue number one that people have in general that that I also have is like the players are the ones who are kind of uh, the ones who have to to take the the hit on this. The second issue I have is that I hope, like we talked about earlier, that people don't leave the region because yes. L- LPL has had a salary cap for, a, a, you know, an SFR, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, for a while. But I don't think that, that has stopped them from spending tons of money because of the uh, viewership is super high there. And if they are taxed, like they don't care, like they will spend the money. And if players leave our region and viewership goes down, then we've created an even larger problem than the one that was in place in the first place, where everyone is suffering, even the LCK, not just teams and orgs. So. I really hope that this doesn't lead to a second big Korean exodus because that could because we don't have the new popular talent right now to replace it. Well, I think you touched on a lot of good points here. One, uh, but let me just uh, talk about one thing. So LPL, their player salaries actually went down this year. The average went down this year. Um, I mean, there's let's say one exception. Okay, okay, hold on. Before <laughs> you say anything more about um, averages, though, like it's a 17 team region where players like Hoya, for example, are going over there. You've got UCAL over there, like, you know, I mean, the the just to put it out there, like, the, I'm talking about big players leaving, not like averages sure, of like sure. UCAL went over there and you know, making, there's like, always going to be teams whatever, that, you know? that decide to spend through uh, the SFR, and we have that ability as well in in the LCK. So, you know, I think one LPL actually went down. The SFR is working over there. Um, that's there's a reason why a lot of LPL players actually came back to Korea, right? Because the contracts are so lucrative now in Korea sure. that you can be at home and play. But number two, you bring up a really good point, and this is why I probably annoy the hell out of uh, Riot and everyone there. I actually view this, I take it very personally that we need to figure this out and create better revenue streams and create better incentives for players to do more content, to do more social media, to do all of these things, because you need that platform if you're going to retire and do something, right? The fact that none of our players are incentivized at all to do any kind of social media, and it's just, oh, Arnold, it's right. like it's better for your career to do it. You know, that's <laughs> that's crazy to me, right? Because let's say you're opening a chicken shop and you have 10 million followers on Instagram. That's a better chicken shop. Yeah, that, that chicken yeah. shop has a better chance of succeeding than right now, which is, oh, how dare you do social media? right like you should be practicing right like well no i I don't blame the player i blame the league system that doesn't encourage you to actually do all of this content to do social media to do any of this stuff right like i always think about a great model being like the ufc right like the ufc fights like 10 minutes but all the stuff leading up to it and all the hype all the trash talking all the yeah, yeah. yeah Man, that is incredible, right? It makes you, it makes that 10 minutes worth spending a hundred bucks. Go Korean Zombie, by the way, uh, August 30th. <laughs> um, like, we need to get to a system that's like that. And, you know, uh, one controversial idea that I had was hey, you know how there's like a player of the game thing? But it's already meaningless. Uh, why don't we have one of the votes be fan votes? And the first, first criticism is like, well, Faker's going to win everyone. That's the fan vote. It's like, well, it's only one vote. And if he's bringing that much 
attention and viewership to the league, he damn deserves it. <laughs> I mean, you know? It, and it, it incentivizes it has been, it has been players to actually build a social following, right? I, I actually think that it, it like obviously the POG voting has been it has been discussed doing a fan vote. It is it, it comes up a lot actually. And like a lot of people are for it, a lot of people are against it. Um and trying to integrate it into like social media so that we get more social media people talking about POG and then talking about the LCK as a result. Like it's absolutely something the LCK is thinking about, especially when you consider like right now everybody's really trying to figure out like is does media deserve three votes? Um and, and, and the narrative around that. But uh I mean I I like I know that for example Pays is, you know, obviously Genji's newest player, rookie of the year. We are just calling him rookie of the year now because like there's no other option. Um <laughs> He he has tweeted like a decent amount. Like he ha he has a Twitter, right? And like he has on average it looks like, you know, 50 50k uh views on all of the stuff he's posting and he's posting pictures of his cat and stuff and it's very cute. He's not posting that often, but I think like the proof is there that this new player who just appeared on the league and is a new star already has a ton of um social media interactions has uh, 7600 followers on Twitter uh, and a and a fairly inactive Twitter, mind you. Um and you know he's just posting pictures of like animals Cat, um, cats and, so cute. and they're very cute uh but like even pays is like kind of got it figured out like he knows that like he, sh he should be building this a little bit and he wants to share parts of his life um and that's what people want to see and uh, around the world like a picture of a cat like has no has no like language right like he can interact with fans literally anywhere in the world with with stuff like this and I'm surprised that some of our bigger players don't do this. And like, it's the typical esports social media thing where like, like BDD, for example, famously like only posts after like a really tough loss, and like he'll like only go on Twitter when he's like, oh man, I messed that up, or like Umpty as well is like pretty. He posts on social media a decent amount, but usually I like to say like, oh man, that was a tough one, or like he kind of memes a little bit. But you see him post like once he must every be few on months. there all the time. He must be on there all the time. Well, I mean, but like, <laughs> well, but like, think about it this way: players right? don't build their brands or show their lives that much, or like what they're eating, even, or like, hey, time out with the boys. Like I'm out with my my jungler, and we're gonna go do a thing. You know, like I feel like that's that should be encouraged more. And I, I do think there's a ton of value that people want to see that so desperately. It's just, it's, there's proof of this. Like every time Chovy tweets, like it's like a bajillion interactions coming through. Even if he like tweets just the letter a, everyone's like, yes, Chovy said a, like, I want to like it. I want to, <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's all the contracts have a, <laughs> like, I think it's like a minimum, like one tweet a month or something in our contracts. Uh, it's like nothing, but it's just to get them started and comfortable. Uh, we, I even brought in, like, I had even had them even talk to Jay Park, a uh, Korean hip hop artist, just kind of talking about the value of a brand and all of this stuff. So I'm really trying to help them understand that, like, you know, and like if fans criticize because we lose or something, I'd be like, just blame the team, just blame the org. Like, I'll take it, I'll take it. Like, I'm, I'm fine with it. But who blames think, people for, like, I took a picture of what I ate to the fans, like, oh, he's just not focused on practicing. I, you know, there's, I he think took a people picture of his meal. <laughs> there's a lot of things that people do. Like, I heard uh, some fans were upset. They were like, oh, if you don't eat enough carbs, you can't, you know, you're not going to be a good player or something like that. It's just like, it has nothing to do with anything. Um, trucks for carbs. Get the <laughs> trucks out there. Send them to the um, park. Carbs for players. But I think, one of the things is that the league should be more proactive in encouraging building content. And, and the reason why players haven't historically done that, you didn't need to. Your salary, on average, tripled in the last three years doing zero, zero yep. tweets, zero Instagram posts. I mean, it's been the same nothing. thing in the LCS, right? You, you compare it to – it's very easy comparison in the LCS because we know what happened when – the players were super popular streamers in the early days of the LCS when they were the biggest gaming personalities. This is before many of the other streamers took over. There wasn't really a question that people like Hotshot GG were among the most popular streamers in the world. Uh, and that was what drove a lot of the early LCS interaction. But as more and more money came in, they didn't have to do that anymore. And so that's where the decline in viewership started. Yeah, and, and I think that symptom you know, is going to be gone because there's no free money coming in anymore, right? So I feel bad that, you know, with this, you know, player salary growth is going to slow. Uh, I'm not sure it's actually going to fall, um, to be honest with you, but I think it'll slow the growth. Um, 
Actually, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's it depends. Depends on it'll probably you know, depends on the choices the teams make, right? Yeah, it really like, depends you, on what the know. teams decide to do, right? So it's hard to tell. Um, but you know, at least for us, like we're we're committed to spending up to the SFR, um, and I'm fine investing and still losing money for the next few years uh, in in the league. But I need more promises and I need a bigger push to get this thing right and to actually create revenue streams because. Otherwise, uh, this stuff just doesn't work. And I think also you're going to start seeing more players. And I think the league needs to start pushing more content requirements on the players. And the players won't like it. But the way I view it is it should be the team's job to be annoyed at the league for making them do this stuff. Like, that's our job. Our job is to protect our players. Our job is to protect our coaches. And their job is to complain about every single content thing that they have to do. I want them to do that. I'd rather have that than somebody that just only wants to do content. <laughs> you know, I, I, mean, I the love team. the content that LCK is making and um, like the content they've focused on this year with some of the older legends, right? Like bringing in like Kakao and Easy Hoon and stuff and, and Marin and making that kind of stuff is really fun. Or but ultimately, like, and all that stuff too. But and, and like Lolly Knight is great because you get to hear from the players like from a more direct perspective. But unfortunately, like I think these things aren't what are going to bring the revenue to the league or the teams more than anything else. I mean, I think it's a good start, but there needs to be some sort of way to interact with fans in like almost a transactional way to where they can straight up bring more revenue in. Um, because as it is right now, like, you know, those things are increasing viewership and, and allowing more sponsors to come in, but it's just a small thing. And it does make the LCK look better. And I think it does like widen the LCK kind of, birth in terms of like okay now we're talking to old players and like we can actually bring these guys in and help support them because they're ex-players and they also you know want to appear and stuff and do things and, and then help them build their stream so we have this larger lck ecosystem but i mean increasing ticket sales you know increasing ticket prices again just a drop in the bucket like these are these are very difficult problems to solve and everyone has put their heads together and we still don't have the answer and so I'm I'm really hoping that we can figure it out because, you know, at the end of the day, I want the LCK to be forever. You know, we've done 10 years. We're on year 11, and I, I really hope that this can be solved. Um, or who knows what's going to happen in the future. You know, like you, you said, potentially downsizing. You know, maybe we have less teams. I don't know. I don't want to think about that future. And one thing that I think... I mean, maybe they'll, overall, pay you, uh, maybe they'll pay you $6 million to go away, Arnold. <laughs> One of the huge things that I think we need an overhaul of, too, is the, uh, and, and this is another topic for another time, but the challenger system and the academy system for, for LCK is, just needs a complete overhaul. The way it's working right now is basically teams holding on to players and, and using them as, as potential outs for revenue, as well as like basically just having to pay this extra cost in the, in the bottom of things where it's not really being utilized that much. It has been utilized, by the way, this year more than ever before, but still isn't really making a huge impact where like we're seeing like new superstars come through into the league. Clear fixing Birdall's problem, for example, is just a more recent example, isn't like a, a, a saying that the academy system is working. I mean, so for us, I, I can I I can only speak to like what we do, and I think we've shown it is we've sent players on our academy team kind of all over to every team, and that's kind of been our long-term focus, which is you want to join us because we give you the best opportunity to become a pro. And like, will I ask for a transfer fee? Yeah, of course, but we'll never, we've never held a player hostage or anything like that. I, I, actually, I don't want to use uh, like the words on Reddit, like, oh, that player's held hostage, all of these kind of things. It's more <laughs> like anytime that there's multiple offers, we look at them as they're anywhere reasonable close. We make our recommendation to the player and have them choose where they want to go. Right. Like it's ultimately their decision. Right. Um, and then we try to do things the right way, because I think long term, we want the best young players to join our system. And we said so many kids pro uh, to very de degrees of success, depending on how you want to judge it. Um, but, you know, we've been like really excited about that. But I also agree with you. Like, I, I know a bunch of players right now that I'm like, man, these guys are good, but they're stuck. And some uh, players have been stuck forever. And then the running gag is like. They're not going to the LCK. They're going to like LEC next year because you know there's just no space in the LCK to be competitive. No one wants to, to take a chance on these guys, and some of them are locked into their contracts as well. And 
it's just uh it's a system that i feel like isn't helping the lck right now like it's just really not and we've tr we've made it more and more lenient and the call-ups are easier and easier than before and like some yeah, teams are slowly are using it yeah. but like it's 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 getting better but it's still just it doesn't it doesn't feel like the intent for challengers is actually working as planned at and all at the moment. part of this is also a symptom of the business model not working teams resort to having to try to demand exorbitant transfer fees yeah, because exactly they have no exactly. other way to make money right and exactly. that to me again whenever a system is broken it's easy to find people to blame right because everybody's kind of optimizing under a bad system right and so for me how do we fix the system how do we create a real revenue stream how do we actually make sure that costs are aligned to revenue and that when revenue grows, that players are rewarded, right? Like that's kind of my North Star. It's right now, none of this stuff, the system doesn't make sense. I've been very, I don't know about very happy, but I've been more pleased that now there seems to be more change happening, honestly, because teams are going bankrupt. Uh, I actually think the this is a great thing. The bubble bursting is actually very good for the scene because I think it'll force it to to actually become at least mildly profitable. And it also incentivizes teams and leagues to actually do something and understand that they have to grow viewership, that they have to grow content, they have to grow everything around the scene instead of worrying about what a forum poster says, right? Like I always bring up the example of, uh, you know, I, I'm big into Reddit and forums, both Korean and English. Uh, and like, I follow like, for instance, like the baseball forum, right? Everybody hit at the MLB pitch clock. They were like, this is a disgrace to the game. I, no, I think it's great, man. <laughs> and it, I want to watch baseball now. I'm actually trying to get Dodgers tickets now uh, with, my, with our hookup. But um, like, I, what I would push for is for the league to take more aggressive stance and to accept the fact that they can't be perfect, that they will do things that are controversial and that like that player of the game vote, it's better to try and see if it fails rather than debate. I've been hearing about this debate for three years now. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, like, we, we, I think something that we will all agree on is that the LCK is not pushing change enough. Like, and that is something that I have given feedback to to Riot and and, and the LCK because I mean the LCK is its own separate entity from from Riot, but like the. The feedback I've given is I think we need like a lot of different um, stuff in terms of like making the production better each year instead of like it looks the same. And like this year we had some changes, right? We got some new music. We got some some new additions like the fans at the beginning and stuff like that. But that's to me, <coughs> excuse me, not enough. And I and I, I think there are changes that can be made functionally to make the LCK more fresh every year and more interesting and, and more player focused that also if you if done correctly can also save money uh as well like there are ways to like change what we're doing now save money and then put more player focus so um as it is right now like, like for example we don't do pre-game interviews with players at hey, all. Did, i uh was the one that asked for the post-game interviews i was one of the one of the team uh people but i was kind of leading the charge around hey even after you lose you should do an interview right you should because have the option you know at least no, it's your job. I, yeah. When you have a job, we luckily landed it. So I'm more extreme, but like, I think we landed in a good place where one person, it's their job. And like, usually the team captain and the coach and they go together and all of, you know, there's like a whole setup around it. But like, in my opinion, for the long-term health of the league, it's necessary because right now you just have narratives you think of and you just get angry instead of listening to the player about what happened. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I would even support even more radical ideas like the match of the week. One match a week has pick bands comms on. Right. That's one match of the week. One match of the week. <laughs> that's not going to happen. I know. You're I have know, to but, disagree with but, you there. But, but that's that's my point is that like we need to try things that not everybody will agree with. Right. I don't know if that idea is actually a good idea, but like I would like a yeah, league example, that tries sure. more things and even fails instead of right now. I think they're very careful and they've had fantastic growth being careful. But in order for us to get that next stage of growth, I think taking more risks, uh, even sometimes bad ones, uh, is necessary. Um, 
So one thing that they did, for example, this uh, this last week was like interviewing the new challengers players before they played and like getting like doing like kind of like a get to know them very short. Like we're talking like 15, 20 seconds segment, but at least like letting them like give their um like their thoughts leading into like their their debut match and stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff that is player focused. Right. And it makes you go like, oh, OK, I know this player's personality a little bit more now. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of stuff I want to see more. Um. I would and, love Chovy and uh and like Faker to have an argument slash debate before a match, like you know, or something like that as well. Like not not that like they need to go on and like start trash talking each other, but <laughs> um, if you had a good interviewer asking controversial questions to both players, you know, that that creates some sort of interesting content for fans, and then you lead into the match. But it doesn't I, have I, to be I Faker and Chovy. Love... It could be two sure. top laners who are new from challengers. I would love to see, you know, who actually is pretty funny in his interviews, like Kuma Yusi. Uh, sure, talk. he's very cocky. No, I would love to see him, like, to your point, Wolf, like, or even Pays, uh, who's not as good at interviews, but I love him. He's learning, he's learning. He's getting better. Uh, <laughs> he, has, he has massively improved. He's, I remember his first interview in this recent interview, and I was like, oh, versus, like, Peanut's too good, so it's kind of boring when he's interviewed now. He's, like, too good at it, you know? He's, like, clocking in for work. Um... But, like, I would love to see a player being asked before the game, what are you going to do to the other later? Simple I mean, question, they, they, right? I mean, we know. And if they do it, that's so hype, right? We, we know because at finals, when OGM did trash talking segments, those are some of the most fam famous and popular segments of that era were the players doing the, the trash talking before the final started. They were very well edited. They were very funny. And... And I think we have to accept the fact that there's gonna be controversy. Of course. And I'm not sure. Is good, generally speaking, actually, it it is. And I'm oh, well, as long as I mean, there's lines that shouldn't be crossed, of course, right? But ultimately, at the end of the day, right now, I think we're playing it too safe. But yep. I've been excited by this change. I think that I'm seeing from the LCK and all of the teams as well, as they've realized that they can't just do more of the same. Right. And so at least for me, I've been excited to see this change happening. I would want it to go faster um, just because I'm very impatient and I'm more like a startup guy than like a Chebol employee that's been there for 30 years or whatever the heck uh, other teams are set up as. Um, and I'm probably a little bit more uh, fine with controversy uh, and, and taking risks than others. But um I've been excited by the fact that there seems to be a renewed energy for change, at least from the conversations I have. And I think a lot of that is also teams are realizing, man, we got to do something because it's just not working. We can't just rely on trying to win worlds every year. That's just like not a thing, right? Yeah. I mean, if the game plan is you have to be the number one team in the world. And you <laughs> to make to any digital make money. money. Any, any, <laughs> any digital revenue. <laughs> yeah. uh, that makes sense, right? We've gone through... Well, I, I think this is a really good reality check probably for a lot of people because I think the problems of the LCS have distracted from the very systemic problems that are affecting the entire professional League of Legends scene right now. And I totally agree with what you guys are doing. I mean, we've said this many, many times again across Last Free Nation shows, which is that the players have been the biggest winners in, all, in this esports e ecosystem, and they've gotten the lion's share of the revenue. And so now it's time to rebalance this and make this a responsible business in as much as possible. I think you've listed some good ideas for perhaps how that could take place. And we're just going to see how the gap is bridged because you nor anyone else can continue to lose millions of dollars a year without anything improving, right? So shit yeah, has to change. Yeah, it, I think it has to change. I think it will change. Uh, and, you know, we're still committed to investing in the league and, you know, getting there long term. Um, I, I just think that I wish I mean, more look, of these conversations. LCK with fans has a massive. Had. LCK has a massive viewer base. There is no concern. This should be fucking sustainable with the number of viewers that it has. I mean, it sells out tickets every day. Like people want to watch the games. If it's Nongshim versus, you know, it has enormous uh, online. Bro, viewers. it's a full. It's a full. It's a full stadium every day, every time. Yeah, it, it, it there has is enormous clearly, viewers. People want to be there in person. Yeah, there's clearly massive demand across the world in a variety of languages. There is a way to be profitable off of this, surely. 
Uh, that's why I'm I'm, I'm in it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you're talking, sure, you're preaching like. to the choir here, right? Um, and, and I think the SFR is a good first step. But I agree with Wolf. Like that's you can't just sit on this thing and no, bring it. I mean, just you, you'll no. never reach profitability just cutting costs. Like it's, it, 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 it alone is not the answer. It is a it is a a stopgap between. It's it's like a patching a hole to try to then like actually fix the hole. Um, yeah, we, we need an engine. Fix the hole. So we've like yeah. st- we're gonna try to get the fire under control. So we're gonna like stop the fire <laughs> from spreading, not put the fire out, but stop the fire from spreading. And we're gonna try to figure out how to get the engine to work, right? Yeah. Because you know we've been just waiting on the winds to push us for a while. Um, but you know it's very clear that if we keep going with the previous business model, it, this is all just gonna blow up, and it's just it's not going to look good. And I think we have examples of that happening in other leagues. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it's just a new reality that we have to operate in. And I, I, the one thing that I appreciate about you guys having this show and even putting this platform on is this may not be the most interesting topic for the vast majority of league fans out there. They're probably like, I hate this guy. Stop talking. But no, I, no, no, I, no, no. Actually, I think our fan base is very interested in this stuff. So, <laughs> I, I, But I want more of these things. And I don't want everybody to agree with me. I know that's impossible. But like, the, at least for some people out there that are really interested in the business side of how this stuff actually works and actually operates, like I, I think there should be more spaces for this kind of stuff, right? And you know, I, I'm probably going to do more of these things with you know reporters, and when I go back right. to Korea, I think people want to talk. But um, you know, my my hope is that like instead of arguing about make stuff up on Reddit, it's actually like l- hear what's really going on. Right. And let's that work won't on stop Reddit from lying. I will promise <laughs> you that. I, I, you know, it's, it's just outrageous. Like the more I go on Reddit, people just lie about things that I say. It's crazy. It, it, yep. it makes you feel like you're going insane when you see somebody be like, Monty said this thing. I'm like, literally don't think that. Never said it. And everybody's like, yeah, I heard it too. Upvote, upvote, upvote. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> I, I think there's two examples. The less right? time I spend there, the better I feel. <laughs> uh, there's two examples, right? I think there was another team that was so hyped because fans loved their jersey this year. Uh, and I talked to the guy and he's like, we've lost so much money. Nobody's bought it. <laughs> and I was like, what? He's like, but... I read the forums. They love it. They're like, nope, nobody's buying it. Like, and, and when they do buy it, they return it and I have dead inventory. And I was like, but you had like a minimum order. He's like, yeah, it's, it's like not working. But the other the thing that I... Is, yeah, what, what, what happens on Reddit and on these forums is is such a minute portion of what is actual, actual, actual reality. Yeah. Um, and the other example I have is, uh, you know, I like, for instance, in, in Korea, a lot of fans get upset that we play so far away from Seoul. But... I would argue, and this is what I argue, is like, if you think about who's arguing on these forums, they've already become fans. Why don't we go and travel sometimes for finals so that we make new fans so that they can get angry in the future and go on these forums and argue, right? Like, because new fans that aren't fans yet won't be on these forums, right? And so I am all for that, man. I am, I am all for doing more travel finals and even honestly like i've been pushing for for a while i'm so glad that we have our losers finals um actually as part of the venue but all of playoffs frankly could be done in venues i think at this point like with how they're selling it it's it's an insane cost but i think the potential growth that could be had for like the cost is like some of the most cost efficient growth building and promotion you could ever have especially with cities subsidizing costs right because yeah. partnering with these cities allows them to actually say oh more people are traveling to my city so we'll partner with you officially and, and we could do some stuff like i think we absolutely could be doing more with with traveling to different cities and and frankly like who's to say that it has to stop with korea like you know wh- what if what if a final is done in china it happened in, in starcraft in the past as well where they'd be like oh let's do this in china for a little bit there's a massive fan base there like why not um so i, I would love to see the lck and other regions as well potentially be more open to like traveling um, and actually doing finals in a bigger way. And also just even just selling food and beverages. <laughs> it's crazy. Like we, you know, in the last LTK final, like you, you had to go to a convenience store. There was like no food and beverage options. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was because of city. Buy some food trucks. But, um, <laughs> Fewer but, uh, message trucks, more food trucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's but, eat more tacos. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, this is where I really hope 
the league is less afraid and teams are less afraid of the backlash that does happen, but that's part of the job, right? And like David Stern is a commissioner of the NBA, historic, like one of the most historic commissioners, really helped create a renaissance in the NBA. Everybody hated his guts, right? He had great ideas. He had terrible ideas. He made all the players wear suits, for instance, and all these like crazy things. But he put the league first, right? And, and that's what I think is the job right now in a difficult time like this is somebody, the teams, the league, they all have to make these hard decisions that might not be popular. But that's what it takes for us to survive this thing, be successful, um, and, you know, have a team, right? Otherwise, it's all going to go away. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Arnold. Uh, we're going to kick you off the show to actually discuss some of the games that your team played this week <laughs> in a more technical manner. Oh, man. thanks a lot. It was it was very enlightening. So I hope you guys, the fans, enjoyed hearing Arnold's perspective on all of this and uh, kind of... You know, as the esports winter grinds on, it's great to hear from people around the world about how this is affecting our entire industry and kind of the broader network of League of Legends. Because, like I said, so much of the narrative has been around the West and not really focused on how Korea or, or China are doing uh, in this time. So, very much appreciated. Thank you guys Thanks, for having me. Appreciate it. Well, Wolf. We've we've left Arnold so we don't have to embarrass him while talking about his team and their tragic booty blasting at the hands of KT, which we did predict because once again, Wolf, our esports bet match of the week for Last Free Nation. Did we get it right? Yes, we fucking did. We've gotten all of them right, as a matter of fact. And if you would like to be right and make money, by the way, Wolf, I did not only get this match right, but I made a parlay on KT beating D-plus as well. So in, in all, all in all, KT made me over $1,000 last week. Nice. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, but first off, eSports bet, by the way, if you guys sign up using the Last Free Nation uh, referral link that you can see below, it'll be on your screen or a link below this video, you too can get 10% additional profits up to you a hundred dollars usdt um so that's a hundred dollars bonus um if you go ahead and place your prediction on the match of the week and our match of the week this week is team liquid versus nrg so it's in the first round of the lcs playoffs unfortunately a lot of the matches are probably going to be pretty one-sided around the world this next week so we did go ahead and select one that you might be able to get some good some good value on over in, in lcs um yeah, check it out all right well let's talk about KT, because mm -hmm. holy yeah. shit, Wolf, my keen campaign for MVP is looking fucking amazing right now. Looking pretty good at the moment, uh, Monty. Who, who look, do you think? Who do you think fucking dominated these games? Was it was it Pace or was it Keen? <laughs> <laughs> look, the 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 drafting is is what I really want to talk about here, and like. Arnold is not here for us to embarrass him anymore, but like he didn't pick these drafts. Okay. <laughs> the drafting that we saw, like we at the end of 1312, because this is by the way, the last week of 1312, we are moving to 1313 for just one week. Um, and then 1314 is going to be the playoffs and, and week nine patch, just for clarity. So everyone knows that. A lot of people have been asking. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's I was surprised announced, it wasn't but... in 1313 this week. That was weird. Yeah, there were some uh, unknown unforeseen bugs that occurred that Got kept it. us on this patch. So um, at the end of 1312, though, basically what every team figured out is that the simple comp, the one that is easier to execute and allows more power in both skirmishes and late game team fights, is the one that generally works. The one that is hard to execute, very complex, has less engaged tools and a lot more specific single target burst or you need exactly one way to front to back and blow up a single target so then you can get like for example tristana resets that style of composition is just too hard at the level of play that the lck has to actually make work especially when champions like azir and maokai exist who can just say absolutely not you are not allowed to actually make those combos work and genji they went in on we're going to play the hardest compositions possible especially the game one draft which you know across the um lck talent for the global side like, we universally were like, that was not it. That uh, the draft with the Ivern and the Tristana, it was just really complicated to play out. 
and they opted into it into a Maokai. And right now, I feel like Tristana, um, Ivern, like the concept of it is obviously very strong, right? The shields are insane. Tristana has insane scaling and burst. It's a, it's a good concept, right? But what happens in reality is that right now LCK junglers don't know how to play support jungle. That's just not, they're not very good at it. And when you have less engage options and there's a Maokai and a Jax, like KT's comp does everything better. It's well-rounded. It can poke out. It can set up on objectives. It has better vision control. And the Lulu pick I thought was fantastic because well, it also allowed you to then have lane control so you can win with Keen topside. Right. You have the push bottom side. I thought KT absolutely blasted Genji in that game well, one draft. It wasn't even you, close. You know, one of the funnier things, too, the, about the compositional interactions was that Ivern make bush, Maokai put sapling in bush. Yeah. <laughs> then, he, then it does more damage and sees everyone, and BDD shoots you with shock blast because he can see you. I mean, it, it just it, it wasn't working the way it was supposed to work because the Maokai was in the game. And it was just, especially at some of those dragon fights when Peter would just make a line of brushes and I would just watch Cuz just toss sapling after sapling after sapling after sapling into I Ivern brushes. I was like, okay, you guys should be glad he built, uh, uh, he built Radiant Virtue instead of Demonic Embrace in this game. And I, I remember this game specifically, the early game, um, Peanut basically just hovered mid. And he tried to get Chovy ahead, which did happen. And then there was that one mistake where uh, Chovy went a little bit too far. And BDD made that play to interrupt the the jump. And that was and like the breaking point. Old, yeah, that was the breaking point. But I liked what they were doing with Chovy. But I had a conversation with Huni about this as well. And like we, we, we all kind of were not super happy about the fact that Chovy then took all of that money and rushed Shiv. Because the power of Tristana's early game is, is obviously quite uh, substantially weakened by that item buy versus a lot of the other items you can pick up like Kraken Slayer, for example, to where then Chovy could have used all of the, the plate money and the advantages he had in mid to then actually make an impact in those early game team fights and then start to snowball because you're pushing into a Jace, you're already winning the matchup, getting that extra wave clear from the Shiv dysfunctionally doesn't really offer you as much power for the, the power they budgeted into this Tristana while Keen's on Jack's top side and you're losing bottom because it's Lulu into Alistair. So all of the all of the resources that Peanut gave Chovy, he wasn't able to really do anything with. And then obviously when he got caught, that was like the first big breaking point in the game, um, which then ultimately allowed uh, KT to have a, little, a lot more objective control. And then there was the second big team fight where BDD got a, a like, I think even got a quadra kill. It wasn't really about him, though. He got a last hits, but like the fight where they just got absolutely crushed on Dragon. And then the game was just over at that point. Yeah. Um... I mean, also, uh, credit to BDD, who, by the way, this, this is just another instance of, hey, you know, what happens when some of these champion pools are pinched, right? Where do these players go? We saw that a little bit in the Breon back-to-back. -back. Apparently, BDD is going to play his first professional Jace game ever and look like pretty good doing it. Uh, that's that's definitely, I, I don't think it's out of character for BDD. He likes no. to play poke yeah. champions, right? In fact, I was amazed when I was watching the game. I said, really, BDD? It, it's not that I think he's famous for it, but I was like, he's never played Jace? This guy? Like, this guy, I definitely would have thought would have a few Jace games under his belt, but apparently but To me, not. like, in the draft, you know, I, I, I mentioned, I kind of remarked, like, well, it's a great Jace angle, but KT doesn't do yeah. that. You know, and I was like, kind of like, that's not what they do. And then they did it. And I also still didn't think like it's going to be his first professional game. But I thought like, oh, it's his first Jace game of the season. Um, but KT will think outside the box and do things you don't expect. And that's one of the other strengths of this team. But the, the first game just really, to me, felt like it was a draft gap. But the second game felt like it was just a team gap. Like the second game, the draft was obviously pretty tough to play out for, for Gen G, But it was a draft I liked a lot more for them. Um, it's just going to be really hard to play, right? And KT just really outplayed them straight up in that second game, and Chovy did not have a, a very impactful series. Well, I think LeBlanc yes. is basically just a trap pick now. I agree. Um, I, I don't think it's it's very good, even though, I mean, if anybody was going to make LeBlanc work, it would be Chovy, and it's just kind of a lot of the picks I've seen around the world. LeBlanc is just rather ineffectual compared to many of the other champions that you, you could be taking in this meta. And so I think that was part of the problem. I mean, we saw Pays at least get ahead in this game and see, this is, this is my biggest case as Pays's anti MVP 
hater. Pace had to carry this game. He had to carry this game. Yeah. This was all not. on him. He had all of the resources. And instead, he got caught over and over and over again. Didn't respond well on the map. And when all the eggs were in his basket, this is the argument I was making about Pays being a janitor. And you, that has been true. Like, Pays has done what's asked of him when he, he hasn't had to carry that hard. And he's been good in terms of playing his role. But what happens when he when needs to stand up, yeah, when he's yeah. tested, when he has to be the carry of the team, when he has the resources, when he's on a hyper carry like Aphilios? And it wasn't even that it, it was it was so much worse than I thought it would be because he then got caught. These were macro mistakes that he was making. Yeah. And I mean, those, those are the kind of mistakes you make as a rookie, right? And like some of the mistakes we saw from him in spring season a lot, actually, where he was getting caught um, and sometimes winning despite it. But, you know, there were there was some serious issues. And I thought, you know, for the most part, some of those issues were solved. But when the pressure was on, I mean, for example, Chovy going back mid on that Drake fight to like push the wave and the rest of the team is like moving towards the Drake. Like they were just super disconnected. And it felt like the pressure got to Gen G um, in terms of, getting crushed in game one with a really tough to execute draft. And then game two, like everyone felt looked like they felt defeated and you could just see the pressure of like, Oh, if we win this, we get the undefeated season because the remaining schedule for Genji is so easy, you know, co comparatively, yeah. if they won this one, like it's, it's the undefeated season, they match T one's record. Right. And I think there was a lot of pressure on the players. We were talking about it. Um, you know, the, the casters before the series, like I was talking to Brendan Valdez about this. I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like KT has a mental edge going into this one because they have like nothing to lose. And, I mean, and you, I, I don't really know if the they, pressure there, I think. I don't know if I agree that they like win out the season, especially because they have D plus to play. And as we've talked about, that's kind of their weird kryptonite. So there's always the possibility that they, they dropped a D plus and they do have to play Hanwa as well, who is on the up and up. So it, it was, but this was the hardest game for sure. This was, this the, was hardest the hardest game, but, and also like, I, I also worry about those two series more now than I did before this series because I think some some problems for Gen G and, and how they're they are reading the meta currently. We'll see what happens on the next patch. Of course a patch is, but this series kind of exposed Gen G in a few ways that make me feel like it is more possible now for them to drop those games. But before this series I was feeling like, yeah, it's not going to be a freebie, but I think those two series I would have predicted Gen G to win both of them. Um and I would feel very confident about that. Now, you know, I'm gonna have to think about it a little bit more closely. Just because the team didn't look like it was like it, this, KT looked like a team of five players who have a game plan. They have a, a way they want to set up on every objective, and everything they did was purposeful. Whereas, especially in that second game for Gen G, like Chovy seemed angry. He's doing off doing something else. The rest of the team's moving over a little bit slow. Pays is like out. He's like fed and ahead, and then he just gets caught, which is exactly the one thing you can't do when you're the only win condition. Um, so I, I don't think Genji played their best game. I, mean, I, I think KT were absolutely the better team. They played a very good series and they prepared very well, despite having the tougher schedule that week with a D plus series earlier on. But Genji, I think, did not play their best. And I'm not trying to take anything away from KT on this win, but I also feel like it was it was not the Gen it was not the the Saturday showdown I was promised. You know, it was a yeah. one sided stomp, unfortunately. Yeah, I think the it's not that they can't play a lot of the champions that are are meta right now either. So perhaps just a kind of poor read. Whereas I feel like KT just continues to really hammer most of the OP champions. They they realized how broken Kaisa is with, before most other teams in the world did and were able to execute on it. And I think the Jace is actually a really good sign for KT because quietly Jace is also one of the most broken champions right now. He has, I think even, a I haven't checked this week, but last week, he had an even higher global win rate um, amongst the top four major regions uh, than Kaisa did. So, I mean, this is it, we see it all the time in LPL. It's a, certainly a very, very strong champ um, when we're seeing more of the AP, you know, damage coming out of mixed damage champions like Kaisa or Jax, or we see AP junglers uh, starting to rise up. So has been has been really, I would say, quite important. It's just so that. easy to play Jace when there's a Maokai on your team. Like this is kind of the the ease of execution versus finesse style that like we've been talking a lot about at LCK this week is, you know, you could play this like LeBlanc shiv while you also have a uh, front to back team comp where LeBlanc's trying to poke. And I think when 
Shiv LeBlanc first came out, teams were so bad at dealing with it. It seemed just so fucking broken. Everyone's like, this is broken. Like, she can go in and, like, she AoEs the whole team, and then she goes out and you can't stop her, and then she does it again, and we're just trying to set up on, on objectives, and now teams are just like, oh, that LeBlanc is annoying, but we're going to set up on Drake, start it, camp it. If she goes in, we kill her. If she doesn't go in, if she's trying to just poke only, it's not enough damage. We win the fight. It doesn't matter. And then you're like, oh, wait, actually, it was a 5v4 because LeBlanc didn't make any real impact in the fight because it's not the same burst LeBlanc that we've seen in other metas where LeBlanc can legit threaten your backline and blow up an Azir if she gets the right angle or blow up a you know an Aphelios. It's not that meta anymore. And um, I think just the evolution of teams being better at dealing with LeBlanc and having to deal with it for several weeks on this patch um, and previous patch as well just means that just not it's it's just not a strong pick anymore and i don't think we're going to be seeing it like at all um in in future patches because it's just it's even weaker obviously um on the 13 13 patch with the changes to to shiv scaling and stuff but i uh i don't i i don't think that kt have any extremely strong weaknesses at, at the moment monte cristo i i'm kind of looking at the situation <laughs> going like this team they have a pretty easy schedule as well for the remaining matches again just T1 is the the toughest one you could argue and that's with T1's current situation like not a, a match that I'm T1 particularly did lose worried to about Brian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh I I'm I'm looking at this like I think KT's winning regular season is is kind of my conclusion this series was the last test for them. They almost beat Genji last time. It was a series that has a lot of asterisks attached to it but I, I think they did it, Monty. It, I think KT's one regular season. I'm ready to say that right now. I All right. We did it. <laughs> we did it. We were the early KT believers. Nobody <laughs> trusted. Nobody believed. I, Everybody just recited the I, memes. They're going to disappoint you. Don't be excited. No, we were fucking excited for a reason. <laughs> and here we are. And here we are, Wolf. <laughs> what we said, it, it, was, it was a prophecy. Right. This was the prophecy of KT. There was no other outcome besides crowning them in glory. Um, yeah, I, I look, they were just too good. And I think that was apparent. And uh, uh, people people allowed themselves. This is the real curse of excitement. You think get, getting excited about KT is bad. I'll tell you what's bad to get excited about. Getting excited about Doran. You guys, you all motherfuckers. <laughs> you all motherfuckers got excited about Doran. <laughs> Because he was clapping some some bad top laners with GP as he played against, you know, teams like Nongshim and DRX and Live T1 with Poby and Live Sandbox <laughs> and Kwangdong Freaks. You guys were like, oh, Doran's good now. Did you see that last game versus KT? Tell me how fucking good Doran is, guys. Did you see a difference between Keen and Doran? Did you see one? I noticed a pretty big one. So... <laughs> A gap, you would say, um, yeah, potentially. So, but that's because you guys got excited about Doran. Don't get excited about Doran. He's I was the real happy Razor that game. Doran was playing better. And I, I was not ready to say Doran was a top, top laner by any means. But, you know, I, I thought Doran is not a liability to the same extent that he was at the beginning of the season. And um, ultimately, against the strongest team in the LCK, KT Rolster, uh, he was. He had some problems. So, so tell um, me, Wolf, has the Korean mentality shifted around pays for MVP? I haven't been able to talk to many people about it that much this week because this match happened on Saturday, obviously, and then there was the Sunday match. But when we come on the show next week, after a week of like being able to, to, to talk with some people and, and ha hear those discussions, I'll have a bigger update for you. But my guess is definitely, yeah. Um, and, you know, we talked about this last week a lot and was one of the bigger topics is um the korean side definitely probably leaning towards pays for mvp it felt like from what i was hearing right but it the same rules apply to like koreans also then heavily weight the end of the season more often than they do yeah. the beginning of the and season especially if kt is in first place so exactly so i think there will probably be a move away from that um and that doesn't mean it defaults to like bdd or or anything like that like i think keen is definitely one that's in the conversation but it has been uh, my reactions when I mentioned to people that uh, to Koreans that Keen is my front runner at the moment. Like I actually get a pretty surprised reaction, but I think Koreans think that even though top lane is more impactful this season, that it's not the most important role. Um, so 
who knows what's going to happen, but I, I don't know, man. I feel like this meta top lane is pretty fucking huge. If you look at how LPL playoffs are going and the, the effect that players have like Allah have made uh, in the LPL playoffs, it, it is looking real strong as a role. I mean, when you can apply pressure as a top laner, it empowers the rest of the map as well. So I, I'm in agreement. And I think KT was the first team this season to really play through topside pretty consistently and actually change the meta towards that uh, as a result. And when you have a great player like Keen, it's kind of unfair. Like, of course, you're going to be the team that's going to be able to make this happen more than our other top teams, for example, where you have players such as Doran, Kingen, and Kana, who are nowhere near Keen's level um, at this moment in time. And Zayas has you know been a little bit handicapped this season as well, uh, unfortunately. So kneecapped some might say by Alasa, yeah. his 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 teammate so, um well we could talk about the one other thing i wanted to talk about this week just very briefly is the crazy um playoffs run where we touched on the fact that you could like have a 33 percent win rate and actually go to playoffs um, so uh, th so this is to say guys that we have four teams locked for playoffs they are kt genji hanwa life and d plus t1 continues to lose they have now lost uh, the majority of their matches in the second round robin. Um, and they are 50%, seven and seven. However, the top six teams make it, and the sixth place team is currently Kwangdong Freaks at four and 10. Reminder, there are only four matches remaining. So technically, it is possible for T1 to go 0 and 4 and end the season at seven and 11. And it is possible for Kwangdong Live Sandbox or Breon or Dongshim, who are all tied at four and 10. One of them, you know, or two of them. Two of them have to. So it's it's very unlikely T1 is not going to play yeah. off because two of two them would of have them... to would have to at least go seven and eleven with a better map differential. Except yeah. T1's map differential is zero, and the next one is negative ten, which is Kwangdong. So it, it, is, it is virtually impossible. Yeah, it is mathematically possible for T1. Yes. I think there's like we were looking into it, and it's it's really hard, and like we didn't have a ton of yeah. time to do this. But we when we were talking about this on Bog State, we were like, I think there might be exactly two scenarios. It's it possible, happens, but it is so unlikely, and it would um, also depend on map differential, even if exactly. they were to tie. So, so it's it's just so unlikely. So T one's going, you know, spoilers like it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. But they're also it's not, not going to lose decided, but it's going to happen. They also have relatively um, easy opponents. They play Kwangdong, DRX, and Live Sandbox. If they win yeah. one, they're fine. Yeah. So KT is the tough one. Obviously, it's the Saturday showdown next week. But then you have the other ones that are like they're going to be fine. Um. I think Bro is going, Monty. I think Bro has I agree. a fantastic early game. Kwangdong is we on kept a terrible saying that loss they, streak. We kept saying that they were they were much better than they looked, and we were right. And guess what? Breon plays Live Sandbox, Nongshim, DRX, and then Genji. So they can write their own fate up until their last match. Yeah, I think Bro is going. I feel very confident with the remaining schedule and their, their current form that they're going to go. And Bro disappointed a lot of people because they were like beating Gen G and then they had a massive lead and then they lost because Gen G is the better team and Bro has problems setting up on objectives in the late game. But in that T1 series, T1 didn't play very well, but Bro actually played very decisively. And I think that against teams like Live Sandbox and, and you know, DRX, et cetera, like the bottom teams they're competing with, they just have a better read. They are more decisive. They have a clear strategy, a clear plan going into each and every match. Their drafting has been pretty good. And I, I'd honestly be sad at this point if Bro doesn't go because their potential, like sometimes they don't even achieve their own potential, right? But their potential, I think, is by far the highest of those teams in the running. And they are the best team. Like by, I think they're like a whole tier above the other teams they're competing with. So I would be really sad if they don't go because I think they deserve it way more than the other teams. Um, and I think if they can shore up some of their problems, you know, it should be pretty easy for them to do so. Um, so if they don't go, it's kind of a it's kind of a Giga Chad tragedy. It would be Giga Sad, then you could say, if they don't go. And I, I'm just putting it out there. Kwangdong looks omega boomed. Like that team looks like they are just not even trying anymore levels of like I don't know what's going on internally in that team. There are clearly issues, but the, the that team is not playing anything like what they were playing earlier on in the season. Um and then you have like DRX who's also on a massive loss streak. DRX like surprise you sometimes they play well you're like oh like that was a good game and then they have games like they did against Live Sandbox where you're like oh I guess this team isn't going no chance <laughs> no shot <laughs> so all right I that was kind of my closing thoughts for this episode I know we had a longer episode yep. this week but I'm I'm like 
bro believers, bro leavers, you may <laughs> may be rewarded. Yep, a couple good matches this week. Telecom War, even though it's likely to be very one sided for KT, always hype just because of the history. And we have Gen G versus D plus historically a very close matchup over the last couple of years and always fun to see those teams go head to head. Anything else you're really looking forward to? No, I think those are the big ones. Uh, I'm really more so looking forward to to playoffs in week nine and seeing what the, the new patch is going to look like when we move to that um, and looking into it, obviously a little bit closer as we get to it, because it, it feels like we've been on this patch forever and I'm very yeah. tired of, of it and I'm ready to move on. So I'm, I'm looking forward to week nine and, and beyond. So, um, and also to see if KT, uh, you know, crosses the finish line, all, all they have to do is beat T1, and then it feels like they're going to get first place in regular season because they have that extra uh, point. Um, it is going to be about differential, so even dropping a single game, if Genji has a perfect remainder of the season, they could actually take it back, you know, even if they both win all their matches. So that's a really exciting uh, thing to, to track as well, even though it feels like easy stomps for them going forward, at least they have that race against each other. All right. Well, that'll do it for the Monty and Wolf show this week. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you again next week.